It's time to step into the Coming Out Lounge, a cool, safe space to be true to your sexual self. With your host, Rick Clemens. Rick has helped hundreds of people come out of the closet, and now each week he's bringing you cool insights for loving and accepting yourself, boosting your self-confidence, and living a guilt-free, purpose-filled life on the other side of the closet doors. Cuddle up with yourself and get ready for heartwarming coming out stories, ideas for living authentically, and tips for being fully self-expressed. Now here's your host, Coming Out Coach Rick. Hey, 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 closet dwellers and closet busters, it's time to bust out of your closets and once again join us in the Coming Out Lounge. I'm Rick Clemens, the Coming Out Coach, your host, and today we're going to talk about falling under spells and how to really come out and live your truth. So I want you to just imagine for a moment that you're in the national spotlight, in the real world, yes, that one on MTV, and you're kind of that frat boy who's just, well, truly cuter than Cupid, and you're trying to start that next chapter of your life. So what is it that you're supposed to do? Well, you do something simple, you do something big, and you do something bold. And in the case of Davis Mallory, our guest today, his big, bold move isn't necessary that he's getting married to the man of his dreams, even though he's ready. He said he's ready. He wants to find that guy. But instead, he's releasing his very first single from his EP, which is called Loud. And the single is just fabulous. And I've had the chance to hear it. And it's a very beautiful, lush, heartfelt ballad about those special people who come into our lives, who truly ignite our passions and turn our worlds inside out, upside down. And today, I've invited Davis to come talk about his journey as a young man coming out, being in the national spotlight on MTV, and to walk us through some of the experiences that he's had of falling under people's spells and discovering how his art and his music and his music videos truly imitate his own life. So welcome to the Coming Out Lounge, Davis Mallory. Hey man, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me today, Rick. Absolutely, man. So I'm going to let our audience know that Davis told me before we even came on to record this that he's a little bit under the weather. He's fighting a little bit of a cold. So if his voice sounds a little bit different, not that you may not know what it sounds like unless you're really familiar with him, but I knew as soon as we got on the phone, I'm like, uh, okay, I can tell this guy's got something going on here. And then he shared that with me. So anyway, sorry to hear that, man. It sucks when we have those moments, it's okay. right? So yeah, like, I guess it's just a change of yeah, it's just the change in the weather and everything. And, of course, where you're at, you're in Nashville area, correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so that area of the country has really been getting hit with a lot of storms and everything. And so not surprising that you're not feeling real well. So let's kind of take a few steps back, talk a little bit about how you came into this space of kind of being in the national spotlight, so to speak, and being on MTV's real world. What got you there and what was the thing that really inspired you to go for that? you know, reality TV show. Yeah, I mean, I watched The Real World when I was a high school kid back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then I auditioned to be on the show my senior year of college. Mm -hmm. It was my first real job once I graduated college. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I would get on. It was just a bit of a fun thing to do on a Saturday afternoon in college. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it was my first job after school (laughs) when I graduated yeah. So suddenly, you know, here you are graduating from college, and now you're like on a mat, you know, a very well known TV network doing a show that a lot of people know about. That had to be just an interesting time of its own for you, having just come out of, okay, academia, now here we go. Yeah. And they picked me because I had just come out of the closet mm-hmm. at my college that summer, like very freshly come out Mm -hmm. so part of it was a bit of a struggle because i was wondering did they like me as a person or did they like the scenario that i was in Mm -hmm. and uh, but it was a good experience i mean i wrote down a list of reasons why i wanted to do the show and one of the biggest ones was that i hoped that i could help other people who were dealing with knowing that they were gay but not wanting other people to know that about them Mm -hmm. i wanted to be someone that people could see and hopefully it inspired them to come out because for me I didn't at that time in my life really have a lot of role models I mean when I was right. on the real world Vance Bass had just come out during mm-hmm. my season I mean Ricky Martin was years after that so right. people like that who I think are awesome hadn't even come out yet right. and I didn't well, we were, we were just 
we were just on the cutting edge of Ellen just, you know, starting to move that direction yeah. too. So you're right. This was an era in, you know, the entertainment world and, you know, life as we knew it from TV and music and everything where people were just starting to knock, knock, knock on the doors of, okay, coming out this closet stuff. Yeah, we're going to start dipping our toes in the water and testing it to see what really happens. So in your own way, you know, you were being a trailblazer. Yeah. I mean, that was definitely what inspired me and felt cool about doing it mm-hmm. was that I felt like I was an early person in in what became a wave. Of, and was, there was already people before me, but sure. there just wasn't a lot. You know, mm-hmm. there wasn't a ton. Right. So. so let's step back a little bit further. So you said that you had just come out in college. And, mm-hmm. you know, as I as my book came out last year, Frankly, My Dear, I'm Gay, and what I found really interesting is... I was really, I really wrote the book for the person who's coming out late in life, you know, somebody who's in their 30s, 40s, you know, who's maybe been married or been hiding it for a while. So really the kind of the baby boomer, Gen Xer generations. But what I found so interesting is I've had a lot of younger millennial people start to come up to me at different things or send me messages and say, I'm so glad you wrote this book because... I'm a late bloomer too, and when I've had dialogue with them, then when I discover they're twenty something or you know late twenties, I'm like, really, you feel like a late bloomer? So it sounds like you came out towards the end of college. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So do you feel like you were kind of late coming out, or did it feel like you? Yeah, were because late? I mean, I'd known I was gay for mm-hmm. ten, I think almost ten years. I came out when I was like 21, 22, but I've right. known I was gay since I was like 12. So it had been a long time of keeping a secret. Mm-hmm. Did yeah. you have other people around you that were, you know, either had come out or people who you knew were gay that were kind of like, okay, we're all in this together, but none of us are going to say anything? <laughs> well, it definitely was the, I was definitely inspired by a boy that was four years younger than me. Say a boy, he was, You know, I guess he was probably like 18 at the time, Mm -hmm. but he was one of my sister's friends and we never knew each other, but he had started out at the same high school I went to openly gay his freshman year. So that when I met him his senior year of high school, he'd always been openly gay. And Mm -hmm. when I went to my sister's graduation party, he was at it and my sister kind of gossiped about him being openly gay. And I talked to him and he was seemed so socially, you know, just accepted and cool. And when I met him, I envied what he'd gone through and wished I had come out my freshman year at the same high school that I went to. And mm-hmm. seeing him, and then going back to my college, and it was my final year of college, I realized I could either come out my senior year of college or never have come out during school at all. And I wanted to know what that was like, and I decided I would come out then. It's really empowering. I can, you know, I've worked with a few people and I can tell you from my own college experience, I did come out in college. I came out freshman year. I'm trying to remember if it was, I'm pretty sure it was freshman year. I know I was 19, so it had to be definitely freshman, or early sophomore year. And we're talking back in 1981, 82 era. And so the gay epidemic was in full swing. Nobody knew what was going on. And... I went back in the closet, obviously, because, you know, I got married, had kids and and kind of knew underneath it, but kept saying, oh, no, this is going to go away and all this stuff. But to what you just said, Davis, I think it's really powerful that you gave yourself that opportunity, even as fleeting as it may have been, to have some essence of college experience of being an out gay man. It must have given you some real joy and peace to know that you didn't let that part of your life go by without experiencing it. Yeah, because I mean, I feel like high school and college are similar experiences. Mm -hmm. And being in that community is, you know, once you graduate college, life really changes. I mean, I'm surrounded by young people, but I wanted to feel what it would be like to be out in school. So what was the biggest thing you discovered once you did give yourself that beautiful permission to come out and be yourself in college, what would you say one of the things you really discovered well, that was great? You know, my mom was probably my biggest non-advocate, <laughs> that word is, for mm-hmm. me being gay. Right. And she always worried me that I wouldn't be accepted or she always used Bible verses to yeah. 
argue her points of view. And I found when I came out that an overwhelming amount of my friends had no issue with it and were really loving towards me. And at first it was just a big rush of just, you know, excitement and it felt great. But then I did kind of get angry at my mom because I felt like all these people that don't are treating me much nicer than my own mom is. So it was a bit of both. It's something I think all of us kind of encounter, and especially at that age, I remember as I'm listening to you talk, man, I'm like, "Uh, yeah, been there, done that with my own parents because it was literally was I made the phone call and I was, I was about 1500 miles away from home at that. Well, not quite that far, probably a thousand miles away from home. I remember the silence on the end of the phone and immediately, no, you're not this. And, you know, then they stepped in and because I went to a private church college, you know, we pastors and counselors involved in all this stuff. And I felt the same way. It's like, wait, wait, the people who should most embrace me and accept me for who I am are now just turning their back on me. But then there's other people around me. And again, I went back in the closet, but there was my little nucleus of friends that there were several of us. And it's so interesting now that we're down the road. And as you know, the lovely Facebook world and other <laughs> social media have shown up, I've, I've seen them or reconnected to them. And all of us guys that were kind of in this circle all hovered around our sexuality, but not one of us ever said, yeah, this is who we are. And now here we all are out in the closet as gay men living our lives and, and all that. But it's, it's very disappointing when the people you most expect to support you are the ones who either turn their backs on you or continue to give you the hardest time. Yeah. Besides mom, was there any other significant person in your life that you felt that pressure from, but, or just mostly from your mom? I mean, of course, my little brother and my little sister, I didn't want them to think a little differently of me. And so they were hard to tell. Right. In fact, my brother, I think I always kind of treated my brother poorly because I knew my brother was straight and I wasn't, and I wanted to be straight. Mm-hmm. And my mom was like, why don't you just tell your brother you're gay? I think that will help. I didn't really want to tell him. But so he was hard to tell. And my sister, I, I didn't want to tell either. They were some of the hardest people to tell. My grandmother was really hard to tell. But outside of them, I mean, most and a handful of ex-girlfriends were also. It's always interesting to interesting to go through that. As you said, the ex-girlfriends, it's like I got triggered there. It's like, eh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like, hmm, why do I want to break up with you? Well, I'm not really going to tell you yet because... <laughs> I don't know really myself who I am. And actually, you know, as I think over it, I don't know that I ever told any ex-girlfriend. Now, many of them, you know, were connected, again, through the lovely world of social media, and they know where I am. But it's like, oh, their light bulbs have all gone off, too. Like, oh, okay, now we understand, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So as you started to enter into this, you know, more public spotlight and, you know, in the real world, what was it like? to have your truth start to be played out for all the world to be seen, you know, no pun intended there. Yeah. I mean, each episode on the real world focused around my, when it was about me at all, because there was other characters, it was usually about my dealing with my mom and her not liking that I was gay. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would cry and I would get an outpouring of random messages from people that watched the show that were sending me loving support. I had people tell me about a handful of books they thought I should read. And I did go and read several books Mm -hmm. at that time in my life that really helped me to deal with being gay and a bit of science of it and Mm -hmm. even some biblical perspectives on it Mm -hmm. that helped me out. And so I'm curious, I'm real curious, I'm going to hop in here. So if you can remember, what was one of the most impactful books you remember reading? I remember reading a book called The Children Are Set Free. Mm. And a book that was called, like, What the Bible Really Says About yeah, Homosexuality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are both really and powerful I thought both books. Of them, both of them were great books. And I ended up being asked to speak at a lot of colleges about being a gay Christian. And I felt like those books were what I kind of referenced in most of my speeches. That's so. awesome, man. So you get through the, the years of, you know, the real world and everything. Was there any negative experience that kind of sticks out in your mind that you encountered as you were becoming more and more in this public eye, or was it all roses, rainbows, and unicorns for you? I mean, it definitely was not all roses, rainbows, and unicorns. 
And mainly because I was 22 years old and I was a big drinker mm-hmm. and I would drink to the point of blacking out mm-hmm. that time of my life, which partially was because I just was dealing with a lot of self-loathing still, I think. Mm-hmm. I didn't behave my best. As a result, I wasn't like a fan favorite on the show necessarily. I was right. People had mixed feelings towards me. Some people loved me, some people didn't. And so the show as a whole, I got a mixture of nice Facebook messages and mean ones. Right. And so. so what was the turning point where, and, and I, want to, I want to make sure my listeners know that, you know, this self-loathing piece if you're getting ready to go through this journey or if you've started or you're in the midst of it, self-loathing isn't just a gay thing, but it seems to acerbate a whole lot when you're gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender because we are not the norm. And so if you're feeling this piece of self-loathing, I'm sure Davis is going to agree with me on this. You're in really good company. (laughs) We've all been there. Yeah. And we continue to be there. In fact, you know, I've been into my journey coming out for for 53 years, quite honestly. But if I go back to the moment I came out, it's not we're about 17, 18 years into the journey at this point. But there's still moments that I have those little, you know, triggers of self-loathing show up. And when I hold those in my hands and really look at them, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. This all stems from the way I felt about myself being gay. So I need to let this go. I need to find a way to release it so that I can move forward. And when we can do that, that's when we start to grow. But also, what Davis just described about his drinking and everything, each of us is going to find our poison, so to speak, as we go through these challenges. For some of us, it's going to be drinking. For others, it may be drugs. For others, it may be isolating. For others, it may be eating. For others, it may be exercising and really getting in shape. Each of these things is going to be our ways to escape. And it sounds like that's what you were using your drinking as was an escape mechanism to keep from having to deal head on with what you were going through at times. Yeah. I mean, I think partially I just never even been really given the alcohol education that I needed. Mm -hmm. My mom was the type of Christian that said, never drink, not this is how you drink responsibly. Mm -hmm. So I just continuously over drink. Although there was definitely a lot of, medicating right well and self-medicating is a lot of what we do through these big moments in life is finding a way to help ourselves get through these things so what became the turning point where you began to go okay i'm gonna wake up from this i mean just real talk when i was about 26 or 27 i just was dating someone whom i really loved but i cheated on him at least twice when I got completely blacked out and I didn't even remember cheating on him and had no intentions to and I was honest about them both times and I was like I need to change my drinking patterns and for him I went sober for an entire year no Mm -hmm. alcohol that I could keep the relationship and eased alcohol back in a year later but on just a very limited basis Mm -hmm. and then have never been blacked out since it's awesome um at, and that was like 27, so never since, and that relationship didn't work out, but that was the turning point. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have had many, many clients and friends and experienced it a couple of times myself. When I was in college, I drank a lot. There's been a couple of times as an adult that I have experienced the blackout, and it's scary. It's scary when you don't yeah. remember. When You, you know, the, the one time that I, I still, it's very vivid in my mind when I remember waking up and going, okay, what just happened? It was a moment when I had a sexual experience with someone that I don't remember having that at all. And yeah. I, don't re- I don't remember how I got home. Luckily, it was my next door neighbor. But so I only had literally about 30 feet to walk to get to my house. But when you're confronted with that person, like two days later, I ran into him and and he said to me, that was really awesome the other night. I said, what was really awesome? He goes, us, the sex we had. I said, we didn't have sex. He goes, yeah, we did. It scared me to death because I'm like, yeah. wait, I don't remember this. So that was bad enough in and of itself. Secondly, my own health risks there, you know, and I, you know, I asked him, I said, did we play safe? Did we not? And he goes, yes, we played safe, you know, all this stuff. But 
it, luckily he was a good enough guy that he was really honest about it. And he said, I was kind of amazed because you were really cocktailed, but, you know, we had really great sex. And then you actually were able to get up and go to your house. And, and he goes, I was actually concerned about you. But when I we kind of lived in an interesting little community where it was all very close apartments and mine actually happened to be my bedroom used to look out on the central courtyard where there was a fountain and everything. And I didn't close the curtains that night, so he could actually see me in there, and he knew I was asleep, but he was concerned about me. But those are very scary moments in life when you don't remember where you've been or what you've done. Yeah. So let's exactly. kind of take a take a walk to what's now the beautiful stuff. And I think all of this is beautiful stuff that we encounter through life. But let's kind of take that walk through where you're headed now. You started to do some music actually have some stuff coming out here in the next week or so, or it's actually been released already because we're taping this and this is airing the week after that it's been released. So tell the listeners a little bit about what you've been up to musically. Yeah, well, so a little backstory on me. My uncle is an artist manager. He managed the pop singer Amy Grant Mm -hmm. throughout most of my life. He doesn't right now, but he manages another artist named Michael W. Smith, who's a Christian recording artist. Mm -hmm. Um, And my dad's brother is a songwriter who's written songs by Sixpence on the Richer, among other artists. So music has always been part of my life. I grew up singing in my church choir. And part of the reason I didn't go straight after being a pop singer is because I was dealing with being gay and I just didn't see a, I didn't see a career for me in it as a younger person. But I never lost the interest, and when I finished The Real World, I got a job working at a record label in the marketing department, and it was a great place to learn and to just be surrounded by the business. And I started writing songs about three years ago. My very first co-write was with an artist named Parson James, who's also an out artist, mm. and it was the first time I ever wrote a lyric, and it, someone else sang it, and it was very affirming. I moved to Nashville in 2013 and began working on writing my own music that I could sing. And I've written at least over 130 songs in the last two years. And I've kind of picked what I thought was some of the stronger pieces and I've put together an EP that's coming out in April, on April 25th. And the very first song I'm releasing for Valentine's Day is called Under Your Spell, which is a love song that I co-wrote with the producer of the song. His name is Keller. He's a Nashville-based producer who makes pop, kind of electronica mm-hmm. beats. And he's not a singer, just a producer. And a, So he gave me a handful of beats to listen to, and I picked one out that I really liked. And we together wrote this song about being under someone's spell, so basically being in love. So let's go a little bit deeper into that. So under someone's spell, being in love. I know for most artists, our art imitates our life. That's kind of where this under your spell song came from, correct? Yeah. Ironically, I'd written it after my most recent boyfriend of about two and a half years. And I had broken up. Although, interestingly, he lives with me right now. We broke up about a year and a half ago and he's still in my life every day. He's just Mm -hmm. like a close, close friend of mine. So it's a bit about him, but it's also about other people who have touched me before because I've been in about three long-term relationships in my life, and each time I've met that special person, it's it's a song about all of those those loves mm. for me personally, and for anyone to listen to it, I would yeah. you know just anyone that you've fallen in love with before. Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna have a link over to it and everything so that our listeners can hear that. But it sounds like you have. There's a couple of things I want to pick up on because this happens so much in the coming out world. First of all, that that you're able to move on from a relationship and still have that person in your life says a whole lot about both you and him. And this is something that yeah. I think a lot of people struggle with is done over and see you, f- you and we're out of here. And yet, in some cases, that's the only way it can be. In other cases, people will sit and judge that and go, how can you do that? And I'm wondering, for you, there must be something that's really enabled you to be, you know, I guess in the way of our former first lady, when they go low, they go high. How's that worked out where you guys could really continue to make this work between you by being roommates? Well, it hasn't been easy. And I'll be honest, I think we each kind of want different things. I think 
when we first broke up, I wasn't ready for us to be broken up. I think he was. Right. And then he wanted to get back together, and then it was just messy. I don't know if it's how easy it is to break up and get back together with people. Usually, I always tell people, if you break up, you probably should stay broken up. And well, I think, it, it, I think it's a bigger thing to be able to – you just said, dropped a really beautiful – value bomb of, you know, understanding that we're not, it's not working. We're not meant to be together. I think when people keep trying to make it work, they haven't reached that point where they realize this isn't in either one of our best interests. When you can get to that space and really embrace it without it, yes, it's going to hurt. Okay. There's no doubt that's going to hurt. But when you can embrace that, you know, we're just not good together. This isn't, we both have different aspirations and things we want. Then it becomes much easier to not point the finger of blame so much and instead just embrace, okay, we get this. This isn't what it's meant to be. I think that's the big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, earlier this year, he moved away and left Nashville to move down to Florida where his older brother lives and is living there for the summer. And we were still talking every day. He's become someone I just really value his creative opinion on. Mm -hmm. So if I'm recording music, I usually share my songs with him before anyone else if i'm making a music video i usually send my videos to him and i always just really value his opinion on stuff and he decided he wanted to move back to nashville and said he wanted to move in with me and he moved in with me december 1st this year so just a little over a month and a half now he's lived with me Mm -hmm. and it's gone pretty harmonious like the whole time i mean i've I've, we've talked about getting back together, but I think we both agree that that's not in our best interest. So mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to get back together. Yeah. But he's someone that I very much care about, love. So Well, I think that's the piece is when you can yeah. find that, you know, you can love and care about someone and it's going to be okay and you can still do this. Then it's a, it's a whole different ball game. You know, there there's yeah. things that you can step into and say, hey, I'm okay with this. This is, and that's all it has to be is that you're okay with it. We don't need everybody under the sun to be okay with it. You know, you get to be okay with it. And that's the most important thing. So, so you've, you've gone through a lot of different things, made a lot of progress, all this great stuff. So as we wrap up here, I'm just curious if you'd love to leave like that really powerful value mom or, you know, a piece of advice for people who may be struggling or just starting the journey, what would be something you'd love to leave the listeners with to say, here's something as you're going through this, I want to leave you with this to help you out. That's tough. I hadn't prepared that. So I, I know. And I always, see. it doesn't have to be perfect. And I always throw this at the guest at the last minute because I, I want it to be that organic, you know, come from the heart sort of thing. And you've already delivered such beautiful stuff, you know, and give you that moment to kind of think through your own journey and what would be the thing really resonates for you yeah well i mean i think from for me when i turned 30 years old i realized that like my life was it felt more precious and i had always dreamed of being a singer and a recording artist and at 30 i felt like i'd missed my peak you know Mm -hmm. justin bieber starting at like 15 but like that was when i was supposed to really go after it but i feel like for me right now i'm living my dream and i'm loving what i'm doing creatively so I just feel like if you dream about it, you can do it at any stage in your life. And then back on the subject you're coming out, I encourage everyone to. I mean, it was the best thing I've ever done for myself with sort of just loving myself. And be. I think I became more proud of just being me by being openly gay. So I feel like that is. I just really encourage people to do that. Well, like I, agree. That are not, I agree 100 you know. percent because. When we give ourselves those moments to be who we are, it's a piece of permission. That's what happens. We give ourselves permission. And, you know, as you were talking about your career, uh, being if you can dream it, you can do it. I think that overlays onto the coming out journey as well. If you can dream about being out and being yourself and not having anxiety and believing that you are who you are, plain and simple, that is the bottom line. You are who you are then it helps you become comfortable in your own skin. But you got to believe it. And, you know, the coach, one of the things I do a lot with my clients is, yes, we're going to vision this. We're going to dream about it. We're going to get it solid in our heads because the more solid we can get it, the more positive energy we put off and don't retreat. In fact, it was really interesting. 
I was interviewing another person a couple of days ago for the podcast, and he said something that was really powerful. He goes, you know, when we sneak around, when we sneak anything, sneak and hide anything in our lives, it harms our souls. And when we harm our soul, we can't be who we're meant to be. And I thought that was really, really just, first it was very deep, but it was also very indicative of what happens for us as we hide ourselves from our world, especially in our coming out journeys, that we yeah. really start to harm our souls. So, so anyway, well, you know what, Davis, I'm so happy we had the time to have this quick interview yeah. today. And I'm excited for you, as I said. Listeners, the single is out. This was taped earlier, but it is releasing literally the day after the single has come out on Valentine's Day. So why don't you go ahead and tell us again the name of the EP and the single are? So the single is called Under Your Spell Mm -hmm. and the EP is called Loud. Awesome. And both of those will be available on iTunes. And is there, if somebody wanted to, you know, connect with you or learn more about you, do you have a website or anything you'd like to share here? Davis? Yeah, my website is my name, so it's just davismallory.com. That's also the same username on Twitter and on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook, also at Davis Mallory. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so we will have all those links up, but I like to have my guests say those out loud so people can hear it in your voice. There's yeah. something interesting that happens when someone hears the person say their stuff in their voice that seems to trigger people to remember them better. So I I hate to say them in my voice because they're so used to hearing me talk all the time. But, you know, hey, man, I wanted to say thanks for being here. Thanks for powering through. and Hope you feel better. Excited to hear what happens for you as you move forward into this new adventure in life. And thanks for being an inspiration today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, I appreciate you too, man. And we're going to wrap it up today with... This, I'm so glad we got to share yet another person in the entertainment music industry with you. I love that he shared pieces of just being who you are and dreaming and doing. I think that was a beautiful statement. So we're going to wrap it up for this episode of the Coming Out Lounge. And remember, never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping into living your powerful truth. I'm Rick Clemens, the Coming Out Coach, and I'll catch you in just a few days. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll catch you in a week. Hey, 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 Closet Dwellers and Coming Out Lounge listeners, I wanted to invite you to check something out. You know, for all the years that I've been a Coming Out Coach, one thing I've learned is sometimes people come to do the work with me and they only need a little bit of help to get over something very particular and very important to them. It could be reconciling their religion and sexuality. Maybe it's learning how to have the difficult conversations where they say, I'm gay. Possibly it could be, oh my God, I'm out of the closet, but now how do I do the same sex dating and mating sort of thing? Well, what I can tell you is throughout the years, there are common things that show up over and over and over again. And what I've heard most from my clients and listeners of the podcast is, I want a way to work with you just on these particular subjects. Yay. I am so excited because I've taken the action and I've made this possible. So how do you find out about these particular programs? You go to thecomingoutcoach.com or if you're on the show page right now listening to the podcast or have just listened to the podcast, over to the right-hand side of the podcast description and everything is an icon that says one-on-one coaching sessions. Click on that button. You'll be taken to a page that describes each of the different nine sessions I'm offering. There are one-on-one sessions that we can do via phone, Skype, or even FaceTime. They're very action-oriented. We go right to the topic that you want to talk about. And each of these sessions also includes a copy of my book, Frankly, My Dear, I'm Gay. So what more could you ask for? You get me for 90 minutes devoted to you plus my book. So go check it out. See if there's something that could help you as you step out, step up, and step in to living your powerful truth. Take care. I'm Rick Clemens, the Coming Out Coach. I look forward to working with you. You've just experienced the Coming Out Lounge. Go online to www.comingoutlounge.com to learn more. And tune in again next week for more stories and tips for being true to yourself. 